Hello, everyone. Really, there's been a lot going on. O originally, if you looked at my previous video, I was going to upload some videos uh, yesterday, but I couldn't get around to it because, as usual, things just keep popping up. But I'm doing my best because I, like I told you all, I owe you the honesty that any Christian should owe his audience. And I really never expected this channel to grow in the way it has. I really, it's just shocking to me. And it, it's, a, it's a blessing, but at the same time, it's also a challenge. And it is a challenge, not because I'm not capable of uploading videos, but more because sometimes it's overwhelming to think that I've gone from an audience of around maybe 50, 40 people, and just my students, really, in person and virtual. And all of a sudden, I'm confronted with, um, you know, more than 30,000 people in an audience. So that's always, uh, it's, it's a blessing, but it also is a, it's also a challenge. I wanted to discuss real analysis in this video. And because we begin a series, like I promised you, on real analysis. And it's a journey to unravel the infinite. Because real analysis is often perceived as the realm of abstract theories and endless symbols. A labyrinth of equations that few are brave enough to venture through. But to understand why it matters, we need really to travel back in time. Far before calculus, before Newton, even before the 17th century, before Leibniz, by the way. We're going to look, we're going to go back all the way, of course, to ancient Greece. And we need to discuss Zeno's paradoxes. <coughs> Excuse me. And I begin with the one, the first paradox, which was known as the, the riddle of motion. Around 2,500 years ago, if you know your history, Zeno was presented us with a series of paradoxes that still perplex philosophers and really students of mathematics today. And his objectives what wasn't just to stir the pot, but to challenge one of the core ideas that we take for granted. And that is the nature of motion. Zeno, in his wisdom, he proposed that change, and specifically motion, might be an illusion. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, Zeno, you were ahead of your time in some ways, but that sounds a little far-fetched. And you'd be right. But let's start with the paradox of Achilles and the tortoise. Now, picture this. Achilles, uh, really a hero uh, of the Greeks, of Greek philosophy in some ways, is racing against a tortoise. The race is a thousand meters long, and the tortoise gets a hundred meter head start. Now, anyone with a basic understanding of speed and agility would assume Achilles with his superhuman swiftness, would easily overtake the slow-moving tortoise. But Zeno proposes that this is impossible. Impossible, he says. Zeno's argument really goes like this. Before Achilles can pass the tortoise, he must first reach the point where the tortoise started. But by the time he reaches that point, the tortoise has moved slightly ahead. And by the time Achilles reaches that new point, the tortoise has moved again. And Zeno concludes that Achilles will never catch the tortoise. An absurd idea, to say the least. We know this is flawed because we understand, nowadays, the concept of limits. And that's something Zeno lacked, of course. They had not developed the calculus. If we consider the infinite series of steps Achilles takes, we see that the sum of those steps, however small, 
can still lead to a finite result. In fact, this paradox is what eventually led mathematicians to develop the modern understanding of limits, which is really a cornerstone of real analysis. We also have the paradox of the arrow, because Zeno didn't stop there. He proposed yet another paradox, and that is the famous arrow paradox. In, in that scenario, Zeno imagines an archer shooting an arrow at a target. Zeno argued that the arrow would never reach its target because, because before it could hit the target, it first had to reach the halfway point. And then the halfway point of the halfway point and so on endlessly. Now we can't help but think, wait a second, this doesn't sound right. And indeed it isn't. But Zeno's argument ignores something fundamental. You have the idea that an infinite number of increasingly smaller steps can still sum up to something finite. And this idea is also at the heart of real analysis. And in Zeno's case, what he missed was the concept of convergence. If we break down the infinite steps into smaller and smaller pieces, we can still reach a finite distance. And that really is exactly the idea that underpins calculus and real analysis. It is the ability to work with infinite processes and understand their outcomes. So what can Zeno teach us? What can we learn from Zeno, aside from the fact that he may have had a bit too much time on his hands back then in ancient Greece? I'm sure a lot of the people today who are allergic to work, maybe they would have liked to live in ancient Greece in some ways. They really didn't do a lot except, well, at least back then they did some thinking though. Nowadays, there's not a lot of thinking going on. So Zeno's paradoxes illustrate the dangers of reasoning without the proper tools. While Zeno's logic was careful and meticulous, it was incomplete. His failure to understand limits led him astray, just as many other faulty conclusions, whether it's uh, in mathematics, philosophy, theology, or life, are the result of not having the right framework to guide our thinking. I keep going over this again and again and again. In fact, the most popular video on this channel was the one called You Need Mathematical Logic. Hundreds of thousands of views. And there were people who ridiculed it because they don't, they have an understanding, even though even some of them are adults, but they have the understanding that, and the life outlook of a five-year-old. We have in this country and other countries too, but I don't, I don't talk about other countries. I talk about my own. Uh, we have a population that is in many ways functionally illiterate. In many, in, in, I would say that, I don't know the percentage, but I would say a disturbing percent, a disturbing percentage of American adults are functionally illiterate. And then you get the reactions you get. Some people can't even read past more than a page. A lot of people don't even have reading comprehension. But anyway, as we dive deeper into real analysis, we have to see how important it is to approach problems with rigor and precision. That's why I also have the logic series, which I haven't, I still have to upload some videos on that. It's going to be very useful for this series, though. You need that, the, the principles of that series in order to understand this one. And we have to embrace the, the paradoxes of the infinite but we will never let them lead us into confusion. Real analysis is about learning to navigate the infinite with clarity, building an understanding of limits and continuity. Those are tools that will serve us well in many other areas of science and mathematics. So what is the, the real work of real analysis? Some may say, that real analysis is abstract or un is not practical, but that's precisely why it's so important. It gives us the tools to make sense of the infinite. We use it to understand 
how things behave at the smallest scales, like how a tiny perturbation can cause massive changes in a system, or how we can model real-world phenomena with infinite series. Real analysis also trains us in a critical skill that seems to be increasingly rare these days, the ability to think logically and systematically. We're living in an age where arguments can be swayed at, at a, on a whim, but ultimately hollow. The rhetoric is hollow, if there is even, if we can even call what we have today rhetoric. But mathematics always offers a refreshing antidote. It demands that we base our conclusions on sound reasoning, not emotional appeals or half-baked ideas. I'm growing sick and tired, and I hope you are as well, of the watered-down garbage that is being fed to us these days. We see it in every single aspect of our daily life, whether it be the food in the supermarkets. You go to the supermarkets, most of the food there is utter trash. Toxic, filled with unnecessary ingredients. You pick up the latest math textbook in that, that they're using in some of the schools, and it's all rubbish, filled with pictures and, and uh, watered-down explanations, no proof. It's a waste of time. So what, is the, what can we conclude today? We need to have a call to thoughtful inquiry. Where do we go from here? We stand at the threshold of a journey. And it is a journey that will take us into the heart of real numbers, infinite series, and the very foundations of mathematics. So if you're willing to engage with the difficult questions, to grapple with the strange and the paradoxical, something unusual, then real analysis will reward you with a deeper understanding of the world around us. But be warned, this journey, it requires more than just memory. This is not about memorizing formulas or regurgitating theories. This demands that you think critically, that you question everything, and that you never settle for answers that feel comfortable but don't stand up to scrutiny. In short, we can say that real analysis isn't about fitting the world into a neat little box. It's about confronting the infinite with the discipline and rigor it deserves. It's about building a robust foundation that can stand the test of time and one that can resist the allure of fashionable but ultimately hollow ways of thinking. We are surrounded today in the Western world with nonsense. Whether it be political nonsense, whether it be philosophical nonsense, whether it be social nonsense, everywhere you look, you, you talk to the, and I don't say this to be arrogant, it's just an observation. You talk to the average person today, and when you talk to them about something that is even a hint, with a hint of anything deep, they either have no idea what you're talking about, they kind of give you a blank stare, or they think you're strange. They think that there's something wrong with you. They cannot hold, in other words, they cannot hold, many people today cannot hold a basic conversation. There, is, there are no social skills anymore either. So if you're serious about mathematics, and I mean really serious, let's dive in and uncover the true beauty, because there's a lot of it that lies hidden beneath the surface of the paradoxes. And together we can continue on this channel to sharpen our mathematical minds, our spiritual identities, and build a lasting understanding that will stand firm, no matter how many times the winds of intellectual fashion change. So what can you expect? I'm doing my best to upload as many different videos as I can. Tomorrow, I'm, I'm hoping to upload what is a number. We will discuss what actually is a number. Very important to begin. You also need the, the unique knowledge of the symbols that, I, that, that you can see in my logic series. So if you don't have that foundation, you should look at those videos because you need to be familiar. I'm going to assume knowledge of symbols and all that. This is 
this series is more for people who are already in advanced mathematics. So if you're if you're starting out with mathematics, I'm not saying don't watch it, but I'm saying you, you might feel very lost at times. Um, and then, of course, I still have the uh, the special products. We're not finished with special products. Interesting story. Yesterday, I was tutoring a student yesterday evening. And he, like I said, he's a, he's most of my students that there, there are, I get all kinds of students, but the one yesterday, he's a, a straight A student and he had no idea. He said, I know all these special products and he knew, he knew the special products, but when it came down to the, the, the problems that uh, I shared with some of you in my previous video on special products, he had no idea what to do. He got stuck. What's going on, young people? You need to watch this channel. You need the math that is on this channel. No other channel is going to do this for you. You know why? Because the majority of people who have math channels, and I am going to say it, the majority of people who have math channels, they do it for publicity. They don't do it because they care. I do it because I actually do care about teaching proper, teaching mathematics properly. You can, and if you don't care, if you don't believe me, you can go to those channels and you'll see what I'm talking about. I don't want to name them because I don't want, I don't want to come across, I'm not a petty person. That's their problem. But I don't think I need to mention to you which ones they are. They're very well-known channels. So you know exactly who I'm talking about. There are very well-known math channels out there. And they do not do what we do on this channel. They sort of either adapt the, adopt the, the Khan Academy approach, which is a joke, or they give you bits and pieces here and there. They don't create series like, uh, 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 especially not about real analysis or logic. They don't care. It's all about promoting their books. And that's okay too. I'm not saying don't promote books, but there's a time and a place for it. You look at some of these channels, all it is is all about their book. They charge membership fees and everything. I don't do that. I don't charge a membership fee. I could, but I don't. Anyway, I hope you all are having a great week. I have a lot of work on my end because there's always something. I have to actually today, one of the reasons I couldn't upload is because I actually have to observe uh, an instructor. I'm doing a, a, an in-class observation. So that, you know, I got to see what his lesson plans are. I got to see if he's teaching math properly. And if he's not teaching math properly, God help him. All right. Thank you, everyone. And we'll stay, stay in tune for tomorrow. Hopefully tomorrow, Friday, I have more free time to do this.